Another example for transfer functions is coming from practical laboratory measurements. You have the voltage on a device under test that you want to measure and you apply an oscilloscope probe to measure that voltage. Now the oscilloscope probe is modeled as a resistor in parallel with the capacitor. And then we attach the oscilloscope probe to an oscilloscope, which then finally is getting a voltage across its input impedance, which also can be modeled by a parallel connection of a resistor and a capacitor. The voltage across that parallel connection then gets digitized and displayed on the screen and also saved in the memory. Now you have a couple of requirements on what is getting displayed compared to what you actually measure. And you try to be as close as possible as you can. So the displayed voltage that is getting digitized in the oscilloscope is supposed to be a linear representation of the actual measured voltage independent on what frequency we are measuring at. Then we have another constraint that most of the oscilloscopes on the market have an input resistance of one mega ohm in parallel with about five picofarads. That's a pretty much industry standard for most of the oscilloscopes in use. And then most of the software on the oscilloscopes expect the voltage division to be a factor of 10 from the measured voltage to the displayed voltage. You can also meet the factor of one, so a direct representation, but to measure higher voltages, you usually want to scale it down to not damage the maximum voltage that the oscilloscope can take at its very sensitive inputs here. So for now, let's stick with those mainstream numbers and requirements. Let's start out with transferring those requirements into actual equations with the linear representation meaning here that the transfer function of the display voltage divided by the measurement voltage must be real and you don't want to have any imaginary part. So the imaginary part of that transfer function needs to be zero. And furthermore, the voltage division by a factor of 10 means that at any given frequency, we want that transfer function to be 1 over 10. So basically, we are forming a voltage divider of two impedances, where both of those impedances are a parallel connection of a resistor and a capacitor, here indicated with the indexes scope and probe. The voltage that we are measuring across is the one of the impedance of the scope components and the one which is in series with that one is the impedance of the probe components. So we can form the voltage division which is the transfer function down here. We can again simplify by multiplying with the 1 plus SRC components here and that holds for both of the impedances in the denominator. The 1 plus SR scope, C scope up here cancels out and what is left is the R scope from up here multiplied with the 1 plus SR probe times C probe down there resulting in our final numerator. In the denominator we just cross multiply from the denominators of the individual impedances to the numerators and we can sort the real parts and the imaginary parts. Now we have already calculated enough information to satisfy the first requirement, the requirement for a voltage division of a factor of 10 at all frequencies, which includes zero. So if we look at it at a frequency zero, we only have the resistances left here, 
And with the given resistor from the scope, we are left with one unknown only, and that's the probe resistance, which we here can calculate into nine times the scope resistance. So that means we want the probe resistor to be around nine mega ohm, which is a pretty high number for a resistor. Now satisfying the requirement for the linear scaling, meant that we need the imaginary part of the transfer function to be zero. As we had a complex number both in the denominator and in the denominator, we first need to eliminate the imaginary numbers in the denominator, and we can do that by multiplying with the conjugate complex as a plus jb multiplied with the conjugate complex of that number a minus jb equals a squared minus b squared and that itself is a real number so all the imaginary part is going to end up in the numerator and that's the part that we want to zero out i have applied that to the denominator already here which is the denominator multiplied with the conjugate complex of the denominator. And that conjugate complex of the denominator is showing up up here now in the numerator. And we are multiplying it with the original numerator of the transfer function. That again gives a real part from the multiplication of the two real parts in the new numerator and the multiplication of the two imaginary parts of the numerator, which we are not that much interested in anymore. So the multiplication of this term with that term, as well as the other multiplication, the real part here, with the imaginary part down here, will result in our final imaginary part of the transfer function defined by the numerator here. Now this is the one that needs to be zero to fulfill the requirement that we set up for the linear representation of the measured voltage. Now the scope resistance and the probe resistance shows up in both of those terms here, where the scope resistance is squared on the second term and the other ones are only showing up single, so those already go out here. We have the scope resistance left from here, and the sum of the two capacitances on the right-hand side of the equation, with the minus transferred over to that right-hand side. And we have the sum of the two resistances multiplied with the probe capacitance staying on the left-hand side of the equation. Now in that equation, we have on the left-hand side our scope times C probe here, and on the right-hand side, we have the C probe and the R scope over here, which cancel out. That leaves us on one side with R probe times C probe, and on the other side with R scope times C scope which is our new equation down here. And finally, the only unknown here is C probe that we can solve that equation for and put in all the numbers that we have derived before. And then we can see that the ratio of the resistors is one divided by nine. The scope capacitance was defined to be five picofarad. That means we end up with the required probe resistance of 550 femtofarad. And that is an extremely low capacitance. Only having two wires somehow close to each other is already a bigger capacitance than that. And that also means that the probes for the oscilloscopes are not really easy to manufacture which is then at the end reflected in their price. There are some cheap probes out there that actually can't live up to those requirements, at least not over a wide frequency range, 
and the ones that allow decent mainstream electronic measurements, say up to about 200 megahertz, are actually rather expensive 